Alrighty, everyone, welcome to this session. Um, this is actually hosted by Hawk Media. Um, we have here with us the CEO um, and, and founder, Eric Huberman. Um, he'll be speaking on how to adapt marketing in a time of crisis. Um, there will be a public chat for you guys to submit your questions for Eric to answer at the two minute block at the end. Um, but other than that, I'll turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'll just give you guys a quick background and then talk about basically we only got 15 minutes, so I want to make sure I leave a little bit of time for questions too. So Hawk Media, basically, we're an outsourced CMO and marketing team to companies. So we go into brands, identify holes in their marketing org, and then we spin up different experts all a la carte month to month, whether it's a Facebook marketer, email marketer, web designer, et cetera. We have about 150 full-time employees and manage marketing for about 500 brands currently, about six and a half years old. So that should give you an idea. We're the fastest growing marketing company in the country. So uh, what I want to talk about is basically during this past three months, you know, we've had to help a lot of companies adapt their marketing and what that meant. And really, you know, we haven't been through this before, but thankfully we made the right decisions and saw a lot of success through it. So just wanted to give you guys some ideas on the things we did that were able to drive success. So, you know, when this all started, let's say, and I'm not talking about the start of the, you know, COVID, but the start of the lockdowns and the economic effect of it was March 13th is the day that I keep talking about. It was Friday the 13th. It was the day that, mo you know, that week was when companies started to work from home and started to look at things. And that Sunday was when New York and LA both went on lockdown, the 15th. So, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty. We, that next week, we received tons of phone calls from companies wanting to cut their marketing until they figured out what was gonna happen and shut everything down. And intuitively, we knew that was a bad move. You know, most companies, they, there's a reason you spend money on marketing and sales. You do it because it drives revenue. And if you cut that off, it's not like that revenue just keeps coming. So in a time, in a crisis where you know think you're going to get hit, it, it's funny that people's knee-jerk out of fear reaction is to cut off sales and marketing. And those are, that is like the last thing you should be doing. And we... You know, we actually hosted a conference with a lot of big speakers like Cameron Harold, who helped start 1-800-GOT-JUNK, Damon John from Shark Tank, Anthony Scaramucci, Dan Price, Brandon Webb, all these, you know, pretty powerful CEOs and thought leaders. And all of them unanimously, unanimously thought the same thing. Like when a crisis happens, you need to be a wartime leader and lean into it. Um, the, the assumption we made that proved to be correct is in a crisis like this, you are going to lose customers. It's how it works, how business works, is you're going to lose customers. And so if you cut off your marketing and sales, meaning you cut off your ability to attract new customers, you're going to guarantee a decline in revenue during a crisis because almost every business will lose business. And if you're not replacing that business, you're going to decline. And if you're a business that can afford to do so, sure, if you're, you know, folding your cards and saying, you know, screw it, we'll just, you know, decline as much as it's going to decline us, we'll just fire people, like, I don't really care about my business, then yeah, that's the way to do it. Uh, if you're like most entrepreneurs and want to grow and scale and build and keep, you know, being a world beater, the opportunity is there to actually double down. And so during a crisis, there's a few benefits in that situation, one of which was highlighted heavily in March and April, and is still to this day, um, we put out a uh, report every week on the e-commerce and consumer spending stats. And we're putting, I just saw the draft of the one we're putting out tomorrow. And consumer spending is actually continuing to increase online through May, meaning, so from in February and pre-February, like last year, the uh, mix of online purchases to offline, it was 13% of purchases were done online, 87% uh, of consumer purchases were done offline. In the six weeks after March 13th, it went to 30%, meaning if you're going digital, if you adapted to digital already were there, you had the opportunity to double that revenue stream. And if that was a big part of your revenue mix, that was gonna be super effective. Even if it wasn't, there was an ability to actually mitigate the damage if you helped with online marketing. The other amazing part of this for people that went into it, uh, the cost to advertise on Facebook, on Google, and a lot of platforms dropped 30%. Because all big CPG and travel and automotive and all the big spenders, uh, big advertising spenders that are make it a lot harder to compete if you're performance driven, all pulled out because they that's what big companies have to do. You know, they are way more risk, risk adverse and they just have to stop everything in these kind of situations. And it takes them a long time to get started again. So if you're competing in that space, again, how to adapt your marketing, 
it's it's aggressive to say to double down. I don't know that I would just do that overnight. But what we have seen is a severe drop in the cost of acquiring a customer plus a giant climb in the addressable market online because everyone's buying online right now. The, again, it's 30% instead of 13% of purchases. So our average client over doubled in April. And that doesn't happen. We're talking about companies that are doing 50 million in revenue, 100 million in revenue, all of a sudden jumping to 100 or 200 million in revenue in a month. It is a crazy, crazy situation. And it, it comes from the fact that, again, advertising's down, market share is up, and there was an opportunity there. And what I saw was it wasn't just e-commerce companies that were already set up for this. Um, we have a, I have a good friend that owns a bunch of gyms across Canada that when this hit, he went, okay, we've got to pivot. And he went into virtual training within three days. And he kept all of his customers because they still wanted training. They couldn't come to the gym, but they still that value was still needed. They still wanted someone to push them and help them work out. So they still stuck with him as a customer. But then he was able to attract a ton of new customers that wouldn't normally be able to come into the gym. So went digital, worked. And so again, adapting in a crisis and adapting your marketing, it's all about figuring out where has the opportunity risen from this crisis? Like, you know, there's a, a line that you have to be careful how you use it, but it's don't let a good crisis go to waste. And, you know, a lot of people acted out of fear in, throughout this. And don't get me wrong, there's companies that are heavily affected. If you own a, an, a small airline, you're probably struggling right now. And I'm not being crass to that, but even watching hair salons pivot to teaching people on YouTube how to cut their own hair and charging for it, like there are ways to do this. And it's all in the mindset of the team and the entrepreneur to actually lean into it and go, hey, what is the opportunity in this? How are people working? Understanding your customer, understanding maybe your customer changed. You know, a lot of premium products, their cust every all customers kind of dropped a notch because people are conserving cash a little bit. So if you're kind of a, I'd say more middle class product, if you're selling three hundred dollar shoes or two hundred dollar shoes instead of thousand dollar shoes or fifty dollar shoes, you're kind of in that middle ground. You probably had compression where a lot of your customers that are aspirational buying your product can't do it anymore. But come, people that were aspirationally buying eight hundred and nine hundred dollar shoes might buy yours now. So the idea is to really use data and understand what is happening and how it affects human behavior differently from what you've already been seeing and act like a startup if you're not one and really start to test things, adapt, change and be super nimble in a situation like this. So the last point I'll leave and then I'll start answering questions because I wanna leave five minutes for questions is things are changing on a weekly basis in the way that you have to message it right now. And now we have the compounding effect of the Black Lives Matter movement and everything. And I, again, I'm not speaking, I'm speaking about this as a marketer. I'm not speaking about this on my personal opinions of everything, anything. But when Corona hit, the first thing to do as a marketer, and this did work in the first couple of weeks, people were scared. They were uncertain. So if you could be a thought leader with information and facts, because nobody could find any, or you could be someone that was compassionate and helpful and supportive, you were going to end up getting a lot of business. Like that's what people are gravitating for, towards and people are emotional creatures. So if you are able to do that, you're going to get a lot of audience. Um, and that that's where people started. The problem is that changed. Once a few weeks went by and people realized they weren't going to die and there was going to be, you know, personally, and there was some, you know, they had to, this was start, you know, the new normal started getting used. They didn't want to hear that we're in this together anymore. They didn't want to hear these uncertain times anymore. They weren't uncertain anymore. We got it. We know what's happening. You know, don't get me wrong. We don't know where this is going, but it was overused. And so then pivoting to something else. And now, you know, pre the past week, we were saying that it, soon enough, it's going to start being more proactive. Like, OK, I'm ready. People are going out again. People are opening up. They don't want to hear about it anymore. I just instructed my team, like, stop emailing people with, I hope you're staying safe during these uncertain times. Like, nobody wants to talk about it anymore. People want to move forward. And that is how people work. And so being aspirational to your customers is always the best bet. And so what are they aspiring for right now? And knowing that this is changing on a weekly basis is really important too. So for questions, uh, number one, wh uh, what would you say are the most effective social media platforms in order uh, of success? Yeah, and so when it comes to advertising, understand that, again, it's all about the context of the person receiving your ad. So you know, for that question, and thank you, Dave, um, Overall, we see Facebook, just to give a quick answer to that, Facebook is the number one place for success, but there's a reason for this. So when you're vetting Google versus Facebook, which are really the two most traffic platforms, 
uh, Google is more about answering existing demand where Facebook's about creating new demand. So if you have a product or service that's more of an impulse buy, Facebook's probably gonna be a better bet because if they're not looking for an answer, because that's a difference, Google, it's about timing. Like I'm searching for something and you're giving me the answer to my problem. If you don't have a product or service like that, Facebook's gonna be the better answer. So like Google's better if you're a DUI attorney, Facebook's better if you're a shoe company. Nobody Googles shoes and buys a random shoe company's shoes. It just doesn't happen. So creating demand for your product when people don't know it exists or drumming up impulse, that's better on Facebook. On Google, it's better for when someone's gonna look for an answer. Um, now on the social platforms, the reason Facebook and Instagram are so great is the way you use them. It's, it's a passive experience. You're scrolling through your feed board. You can attract, you're, I'm able to target you during a time when you're bored and not doing anything else and I know exactly who you are and what you're interested in and that you're my customer and hopefully I've tested you know, messaging and copy and uh, imagery that will get your attention. And again, you're telling me you're bored so you'll come take a look at it. So that's why it's such a great platform. Um, similarly, TikTok I think has a lot of potential. I think that's gonna be similar. YouTube doesn't work and there's a reason. It's not a great advertising platform for the most part because it's when I'm going to watch a YouTube video, I'm very actively trying to watch a video and you're just interrupting me. So it's not a seamless experience. It's it's more annoying and you end up getting annoyed with the brand. So thinking through this, I can talk through Snapchat, et cetera. Again, we have four minutes, so don't want to, but uh, there's all different reasons why these are not as good of platforms and it's pretty logical. What is the most effective omni-channel communication vehicle in a COVID environment? I, I mean, you nailed it. It's omni-channel. It's, it's using email, it's using push notifications, it's using SMS. It's using social, you, you, you shouldn't like, it's never, it, nothing's in a vacuum. P different people like different way, modes of communication. I like email, email is my favorite. I just talked to a friend yesterday and I'm like, hey, just email me. He's like, cool, but text me because I hate email and I never read it. And I hate text because I'm on my phone all day and I miss text messages all the time. And I literally will get a text. And if it's important, I'll eat, if I don't have time to like get back to the person, I'll email myself to remind myself to text the person back. It's that ridiculous. So. Different people work different ways, just understand that. So using different modes is more about attracting different customers and giving people what they want and how they want to communicate. So whether it's COVID, whether it's any environment, using all the tools available to you, SMS is hyper powerful. It's about 10 times more effective than email marketing and email marketing still drives about 25% of online revenue. So there's gonna be a lot, people are adopting SMS really fast. There's gonna be a lot of opportunity there too. We have other questions. Yeah, I, I'd actually gotten a, a question from my personal line. Like what, uh, we'd love to hear you expand a little bit more on TikTok um, and some yeah. marketing strategies there. Um, and as well as like, there are also a bunch of text message marketing platforms that are coming out. Like what would be a recommendation and what, what should you look for when you're yeah. considering one? Yeah, so for SMS, I'll start there because it's a quick answer. We vetted a ton of platforms and decided to invest in one called Postscript. It's the number one partner to Shopify now for SMS. Uh, so if you're in e-commerce, Postscript's built the best way. We, we The founder of Clavio invested with us, which says a lot. They're the best email platform for e-commerce. So um, yeah, really big fan of Postscript. And then on the TikTok side, look, TikTok still has to develop its advertising platform more and more. It's going to take time. But the way people digest TikTok is, you know, it's a constant feed that you're scrolling through similar to Facebook and Instagram of like people dancing and doing videos. Like it's not a productive platform, which is a good thing for an advertiser. Cause if I, while you're scrolling through, if I serve you an ad that looks seamless in the experience and just, you know, markets a product or I work with influencers, again, it could be either, but I create content that fits what you're looking for. I can get your attention. And again, you're not doing anything else. So, you know, chances are you could click through. So I think TikTok is going to be a really interesting platform very soon for advertisers. They haven't nailed the performance side yet, but the context is there. The hard part's done. Now they just need the technology to be built. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for joining yeah. on with us. Thanks again to Hawk Media. Um, also, guys, feel free to check out their booth. Um, they have some great offers there, as well as our chat rooms in the networking center to continue the conversation. Um, thanks yeah. to you all again, and looking forward to seeing you at the next sessions. And last note, feel free to email me if you guys have any other questions. As